We're live on YouTube. We are live on a website. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining the webinar today. Everyone that's joining today probably has a family member or a loved one that's dealing with some form of memory loss. This webinar today will show you how to take care of that person and also will provide you with resources to help you assist your loved one. This webinar is a collaboration between Taub Institute at Columbia University and Queensborough President Donovan Richards. On behalf of Columbia University, we wanna thank you so much, uh, the Borough President for this collaboration and co-sponsorship. Also just wanna uh, give a, a quick uh, introduction about the, the Taub Institute that's deeply committed to educating our patients also community members, practicing physicians, and the next generation of Alzheimer's researchers. Now I'll turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Martinez, that she will introduce the Queensboro president. Thank you so much. Good night, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce Queensboro president who is co-sponsoring this um, event tonight. Donovan Richard Jr., a lifelong resident of Southeast Queens, was selected as a borough president in November of 2020. Growing up his life in Jamaica, St. Alban, Hollis, and Rosdale, with frequent visits to grandparents who live in the Rockaway community. He attended Jamaica High School and Redemption Christian Academy before studying communication, radio, and TV at Naya College. College. He later received a degree in aviation management from Bahuk College. Donovan got his start in politics after the tragic killing of a close friend inspired him to get more involved in his community and join the fight to end gun violence. He worked in numerous positions with the city council where he connect with the community and develop a hands-on approach to help constituents. This knowledge was crucial in getting him elected to the city council in 2013. As a fighter for affordable housing, he was proud to serve as the chair of the subcommittee on SUNY and Frankie's during his first city council term. He used this position to fight for a reason in the Rockaway to increase residential abilities as well as commercial and community space, including a new library. He also served as a chair of the Committee on Environmental Protection following his Super Storm Sandy. Through his position, he was able to help secure funding for flood protection to protect Rockaway communities. He has been a steadfast advocate for criminal justice reform most recently acting as a chair of a committee on public safety. In that position, he has held numerous hearings on NYPD protocols surrounding protests, cannabis, and the Special Victim Division. In the City Council, he has been proponent of closing records, islands, and legalizing adult-use cannabis. As a Queen Border President, Donovan is leading the effort to rev revitalize our great border and make it one which work for all of these residents and workers. Please help me to welcome Do uh, Donovan Jr. Uh, tonight. Welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you and welcome Queens. And let me just start off by thanking mm -hmm. Dr. Ritz and Dr. Finesca. Thank you in the Taub Institute for Research on Alzheimer's disease in the aging brain at Columbia University for co-hosting this event and providing vital information to our borough about Alzheimer's disease, mm -hmm. risk factors, and important information about what we as a community should know about this heartbreaking disease. And let me just start off by saying you are not alone um, in this fight. I actually had a very close friend who lost his mother to this disease 
uh, two years ago and we, we renamed the street for her. And it was, you know, it was a very tough time for us um, to see her, um, you know, status because she was such a lively person um, when she was alive. And, um, but you're not in this fight alone. And I think that that's why um, tonight is so important. You know, Queens has nearly more than uh, nearly 2.4 million residents representing more than 190 countries in 200 languages. That diversity is our strength. Queens is growing at an incredible rate. Families from all across the world are saving every cent they have to move to Queens. And yet we always have to remember that the most important thing for our families is our health. And that's why we're here tonight. If our families aren't healthy, we're not reaching our potential as a borough. We see that we see that this is especially true during this unprecedented time while we face this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And as we think about ways to stay healthy from the coronavirus, we must not neglect other parts of our health and that encom encompasses our brain health. This is why I believe it is so important to co-host events such as these informational sessions, which sheds light on diseases such as Alzheimer's and associated risk factors. According to the Todd Institute, Alzheimer's disease is the most common cause of dementia. It is a progressive disease that interferes with daily life and ultimately leads to global cognitive decline, complete dependence and death. As, uh, as the population ages, especially in Queens, Alzheimer's disease is the sixth leading cause of death in the United States. In 2018, the Alzheimer's mortality rate in the US was 37.3%, and in New York, it was 19.2%. At the New York state level, the Medicaid cost for caring for people with AD is over $4.8 billion. And these costs are expected to increase by 28% over the next five years. Caregivers of people with Alzheimer's disease or other dementias provided an estimated 18.6 billion hours of unpaid assistance in 2019, contributing to the nation value at nearly $244 billion, do that math. As the Taub Institute has shared with us, nearly one third of New York City's senior population lives in Queens. The 2018 New York City Health Profiles Report by the New York City Department of Health describes social determinants of health, which are directly related to good health. These include secure jobs with benefits, well-maintained and affordable housing and safe neighborhood with clean parks, accessible transportation, healthy and affordable food and quality education and healthcare. In Queens, these areas with significant economic stress, limited access to healthcare and a high rate of poor health outcomes, specifically diabetes, hypertension and obesity. These factors increase the risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. Both African-Americans and Hispanics are twice as likely to have Alzheimer's disease compared to non-white, non-Hispanic whites. For example, 59% of Jackson Heights residents are rent burdened, a higher rate than residents citywide. In Rockaway and Broad Channel, elementary school absenteeism rate is higher than the rate of New York City overall. Seven out of 10 high school students in Rockaway and Broad Channel graduate in four years, lower than the citywide rate. And in Flushing and in Whitestone, 25% of residents live in poverty compared with 20% of New York City residents. With all of these factors being highlighted, it is so important to have a resource such as the Taub Institute sharing a screen with us today in order to provide information to try to stem the tide of this disease, disease in our borough and support the Queens community. Thank you, Dr. Ritz, for the information you're providing today. And I look forward to our continued work together. Uh, I know this is such a difficult time for so many of us. And you know this pandemic has exacerbated um, many of the disparities that exist across our borough. Um, but, you know, we're in this together. And I think these informational sessions, just getting this information, giving a space for those who may be suffering or family members who need to get information is critical. So we want you to know that you're not alone in this borough, that you have friends, you can reach out to our office. I want to thank 
uh, Brent on my staff and also uh, Carolina who are, who are on, I believe tonight um, for putting this together. And I look forward to, to representing this borough, working hard for you to address these disparities. So thank you so much for having me. Um, I hope the information that's shared tonight is helpful to someone, even if it's one person, um, that's one person that we've helped. So thank you so much uh, for holding us and hosting this tonight, co-hosting this with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, go ahead, Dr. Brits. Yeah, thank you. Awesome. Good evening uh, from me. You know, thank you uh, to the um, for President, Queensborough President, um, and his office, you know, for co-hosting uh, the event with us. Um, so Alzheimer's disease, you know, obviously is something which really affects all of our communities. But I think uh, there is also, because there is so much uh, such a big taboo also around this topic. Um, there's, you know, we often encounter the situation that people don't really ask about it or are afraid to ask about it, you know, talk to their physician, talk to, you know, people in their neighborhoods who might know more. And, uh, you know, that that means that, you know, there, there's a lot of questions unanswered in the community about this disease specifically. And, um, you know, I hope that tonight we, we're able to answer um, several of these questions um, and you know we will also have a question and answer session and we can also provide our information that you know in case there are questions which uh, you might have um, which are not being answered tonight you know feel free to uh, reach out to us and you know and we'll try to help you as much as possible. Um, okay so we're talking about uh, Alzheimer's disease uh, tonight in this Yes, um, so before yes. going to the presentation, so I just would like to do a quick presentation about the team that's uh, leading the studies at Stau Institute, Columbia University. Uh, we are at Stau Institute for Research on Alzheimer's Disease and the Aging Brain. The Department of Neurology, Columbia University Irving Medical Center. And uh, the team is, uh, we are under the leadership of Dr. Ritz. Uh, she's uh, an associate professor of neurology and epidemiology and the principal investigator of di different studies focusing, focusing on identifying the genetic cause of Alzheimer's. We have uh, the National Institute on Aging load, laid on set of, Afri of Alzheimer's disease in African American study that's coordinated by Dr. Martinez and myself, uh, Dr. Fonseca, as the staff associate researcher. Uh, also, we have the early onset Alzheimer's disease study that's coordinated by Dr. Baez and Tamita Bayodeli as the staff associate researcher. And for tonight, we have as a speaker, Dr. Ritz, um, as I told you, she's the associate professor of neurology uh, and epidemiology. I will read her bio for you to know her better. And she, uh, she earned her medical degree at University of Münster, Germany, and a PhD in genetic epidemiology at Erasmus University, Rotterdam, the Netherlands. As the leader of genetic score of the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center at Columbia University, Dr. Reed's research focuses on the identification of genes causing Alzheimer's disease. And she has published over 150 scientific art articles on this topic. She has lead authored the largest genetic study on Alzheimer's disease conducted to date in African Americans, which led to the identification of several novel risk genes associated with dementia with dementia risk in black population. Dr. Ritz is a lead investigator on several studies causing Alzheimer's disease in African-Americans and studies on families with very early onset of dementia symptoms. The main goal of these studies is to identify the genes that cause Alzheimer's disease. Please help me to welcome the speaker for tonight, Dr. Ritz. Thank you so much. Take it away.
Okay, thank you, Sandra, for the very nice introduction. Um, so we are talking today uh, about Alzheimer's disease. Um, I'm going to, to talk about different topics, um, really trying to answer um, most of the questions we know uh, that you know people usually have. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, you know, the frequency in the population, uh, we're going to talk about uh, the symptoms, you know, what, what are the early signs and symptoms uh, people need to look out for. We're talking about um, available therapies. Um, and we're also talking about um, genetic studies, why in particular genetic studies are so important. How do they help us to understand the disease? And uh, we will also talk about uh, research studies that, that are currently going on in New York City um, in which you could participate if you, if you are interested in. Um, and as I said, after that, we will have a question and answer session. Um, and uh, overall, hopefully that answers many of, many of the questions you might have. Oops. Um, so one of the most common questions we always get is really, what is the difference between uh, Alzheimer's disease and dementia? And um, you can uh, just imagine dementia as like an umbrella. Dementia is just simply an umbrella term, which means memory problems, problems with your thinking. And there are different causes of that. Um, the most common cause is Alzheimer's disease. It accounts for about uh, 50 to 75% of all cases with dementia or people with problems with their memory. Um, then uh, there is a disease which is called vascular dementia, which really means stroke. So stroke can lead to dementia, uh, problems with your memory. Um, and then there are two additional causes. One is called Lewy body disease. Uh, which can cause uh, dementia. And uh, another cause of dementia is frontotemporal dementia. Um, so Alzheimer's disease is simply the most common cause of problems with memory. So this picture here shows the early signs and the symptoms because that's a question really we're getting very often. You know, how do I know that I have problems with memory or my loved one and what do I need to look out for in order to, to know if that might be Alzheimer's disease? So uh, you have 10 different pictures here and all of these pictures uh, show different uh, early signs of dementia. So the first one here, uh, you see that's actually a woman She's standing in front of her calendar and she has a lot of post-it notes. And really what she needs to do is in order to really remember what she's supposed to do that day, she needs to have a calendar and write post-it notes. And that was not uh, the case before. So it's really memory loss that affects day-to-day -day abilities. And um, it's really forgetting uh, things um, often or, or retaining um, new information. Okay, then the second picture here is difficulty performing familiar tasks. So that's a, that's a man. He prepared himself eggs for, for decades without a problem. But then suddenly he starts having problems with that. He starts um, knowing, you know, what in order to make myself some scrambled eggs, what do I need to do? First, I need to take, you know, I need to get the pan, then I need to put it on the stove. You know, maybe I need some oil and I need to put the eggs in it. And then I need to turn the stove on. So really forgetting on how to do something, you know, something you've really done your whole life. So if there's a sudden change in that or a gradual change, um, and uh, so that might be a sign of dementia. So then picture number three here, problems with language. You know, the woman is holding up a cat, but she doesn't know what is the name of this object. Is it a pen? Is it a table? Is it a dog? Um, is it a picture? What is the name of objects? So really problems with language and remembering names and words of objects. Picture number four, uh, four he is lost. 
he lived in his neighborhood for 30 years. He never had a problem, you know, uh, finding his way to the grocery store, finding, uh, you know, his way around the neighborhood and getting back home. And then suddenly that changes and suddenly he starts getting lost. So it's really disorientation in, in space where you are, but also in time. Um, people often have problems um, with knowing which year are we in, what's the day of the week, what's the month, what's even the season. Number five, that's impaired judgment. It's a little bit hard to see, but if you look closely, you will see that it's actually snowing. So it's winter outside, but she's not properly dressed. Um, she is wearing very light shoes and, you know, it looks like she's wearing like a dress underneath, uh, no hat, no gloves, nothing. So, um, so problems with making the right, the, the right decision for specific situations, problem with your judgment. Then number six, um, problems with calculations. That's what we see um, very often. Um, and, um, and, and also easy calculations. So calculations, you know, you were always able to do all your life and then suddenly that changes. Number seven is misplacing objects. So what we often see with people with dementia is um, that they start misplacing objects a lot and then also put objects into very strange locations. So locations where they really don't belong. And if you, if you see that here, you know, she's actually placed, that's her fridge. And she's, she put her dress into the fridge instead of the closet. Um, so misplacing things. And, you know, that's a situation when I say that, um, you know, people often get scared and anxious and, you know, because they, you know, misplacing thing is, is obviously something very common. So, you know, we are misplacing our keys often, you know, we are misplacing our glasses that happens to all of us. Um, the difference here is that it's a sudden change to be four in the frequency you know, how often does this happen? Do you then after 10, 15 minute, minutes actually remember where you put it? And uh, do are you putting things into, into really very strange locations? Um, so, so this is, so really the main thing here to remember is it's really, is it a change compared to before um, in frequency and in intensity? Number eight, changes in mood uh, and behavior. So, um, so what you're seeing here is that he's going from being, you know, happy to being really sad, being frustrated, and becoming aggressive. And so, really sudden changes in behavior. Um, and again, also that's a change to before. Um, so if somebody really changes in behavior quickly and several times during the day, and you see that as a constant change, then that might be something of concern. Um, also, picture nine is very much related to that. It's really changes in personality um, and also picture number, number 10. So people really have a lot of mood swings. Um, they change from being uh, frustrated to aggressive to happy again. They withdraw, which is what you're seeing here. People are not um, interested anymore in social interactions, in uh, interests they had before, in activities they had before. So what he's doing is he's really sitting at home. He doesn't want to watch TV. He doesn't want to meet anybody. Uh, so really withdraw um, and, and changes in personality. So, so these 10 signs are the most common symptoms to look out for. So Alzheimer's disease is a global epidemic. It really affects all continents. It affects all countries and it affects all ethnic groups. Okay, uh, you see, uh, uh, these are numbers in millions. Um, you see differences here, but the only reason that, for example, in Africa, uh, it looks like uh, it's less frequent. It's not, it's just that people die from in particular infectious diseases before they actually reach the age um, of, of being older and, and, and becoming demented. 
So right now, over um, globally, over 35 million people have dementia, uh, over 7 million in the US. So uh, Alzheimer's disease is the sixth leading cause of death uh, in the US. And that basically, and, and as I said, it's, it's even, uh, it's, it's over six or seven million people right now who have the disease. Uh, there's a big group of, group of people who have not been diagnosed who have the disease, but um, people who are not seeing their doctor, for example, and that's why they are not getting diagnosed. So it's many more people than these seven million. Um, and uh, this means that about every 67 seconds, somebody develops the disease. So about 1,200 new cases per day. So um, why is this of particular interest also to, to Queens? Um, so Queens is uh, the largest area um, in the largest borough um, in New York City. And it's the second most populous borough in New York City. Um, and um, it's, it's the most ethnically diverse population. Um, and it has a very high frequency of seniors. So 13, 13, about 14% of the population of Queens um, are seniors. And uh, that's why obviously dementia is in particular in Queens, um, a significant issue. So there are two forms of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, most of us know the what we call the late onset form that's really the form which um, occurs in seniors in people over the age of 65 um, and that accounts for about 95 percent of Alzheimer's disease cases um, but Alzheimer's disease also occurs in younger people and that's what we then call the early onset form um, and uh, it, and this early onset form runs in families so usually um, with the early onset form, it's not only one person affected in the family, but it's several uh, people affected in the family. And there are about 250,000 cases in the S with the early onset form right now. And if you can imagine that that's uh, particularly crippling for the families, because that means that people get, there are people who get sick in their 20s or 30s, um, uh, progress really rapidly. Um, and, and also relatively fast pass away from the disease. Uh, but then it's not only one case in the family, but it's several cases in the family. So it's really devastating uh, disease for in particular these, these families with very early onset. So um, how do you get diagnosed or who's making these diagnoses? Uh, so, uh, usually people uh, see their primary care doctor and, and those uh, primary care doctors are also uh, the, the, the right doctors for this to see first if you um, have memory problems. Um, so then this primary care doctor uh, can either diagnose you or just um, refer you to a neurologist. So the neurologist is really the specialist um, dealing with uh, diseases of the brain. Um, there is a Medicare annual wellness visit, and this visit um, in includes testing for dementia, which is really mostly um, a memory test. Um, so that's routinely done during the annual wellness visit, and that's why it's so important uh, to, to do these visits. And as with any other disease, early diagnosis is critical. Um, you know, you know that from, you know, for example, cancer, I think it's more obvious, you know, that obviously early detection is critical, but that also um, is the case for Alzheimer's disease. We do have therapies and these ther therapies are more effective if the disease is caught earlier. So it's very, very important that you, that you go uh, to your annual visits and also um, get, your, get your memory tested. Um, the problem what we are seeing often is what I touched upon earlier on already is that there's a stigma involved uh, in particular with Alzheimer's disease and with dementia. And that's why often people do not want to get tested uh, for their memory, but it's, it's very, very important to do that uh, because any therapy will be more effective if you do that. Effective if you do that. So, 
Um, usually what's being done is if you go to your doctor and, um, you know, you say, you know, I, I feel like I might have problems with my memory. Um, so what the doctor would be doing then is, you know, first he or she would ask you for, for your family history. Is there anybody in your family who might have, uh, who was diagnosed with dementia or who also has memory problems? Um, then um, they would ask you about your own medical history. Do you have hypertension, diabetes? You know, there are certain risk factors which a little bit increase your risk of dementia. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. So they would also talk, uh, ask you about your medical history. Then they would do a memory testing, uh, which you see here is cognitive test. That's the memory testing. And they also do a physical examination. Um, they might do a blood test and they might also do a picture of your brain. Usually it's an MRI image in order to see um, how your brain looks like. And if there are signs um, of dementia on these MRI images. So uh, there, there are five different FDA approved treatments, uh, medications for Alzheimer's disease, um, which um, ameliorate a little bit, all of them, different symptoms. Um, and these medications are not a cure. What they do is they temporarily improve the cognitive symptoms, uh, memory loss, confusion, problems with thinking and reasoning, and then also some additional uh, symptoms um, someone might have. For example, uh, some people have hallucinations and a little bit psychotic symptoms. So also this. Um, and then there's also non-pharmacologic therapy. And this is really mostly in order to enhance the quality of life of the person living with dementia. So there, you know, there's computerized memory training, cognitive stimulation, um, and therapeutic activities to maintain overall health. So in particular, the, the cognitive stimulation is very, very important and it can really slow the progression of the disease. Um, so what are the risk factors for Alzheimer's disease? Um, Alzheimer's disease is, it, it's clear that it's caused by a combination of genetic factors and what we call lifestyle and environmental factors. So it's a mix of both. Um, what we know, for example, is that diet is important. Diet, you know, that's a question many people have. Does you know what you eat um, affect your risk of becoming demented or having memory problems? Yes, it does. We know that certain diets increase the risk of dementia and that other diets decrease the risk of dementia. So this is why it's a very important topic. Um, so usually, um, you know, the bottom line here is what your doctor tells you what's good for your heart is also good for your brain. Okay, so. Uh, diets that are rich in vegetables, in fruit, in fish, um, and in unsaturated fatty acids, those are good for your brain and those decrease the risk of dementia. Okay, so what you should avoid is, is for example, fried food um, and, um, you know, a lot of desserts, and uh, what your doctor would tell you is unhealthy. So really try to stick with more vegetables, with more fruit, uh, with fish, um, and nuts are very healthy too. And uh, try to really uh, have a diet that's rich in these, in these uh, nutrients. So you see here on the left side of the picture, really uh, the foods you should eat on the right side are the foods you should try to avoid. Okay, then um, I think that's almost self-explanatory, but the biggest risk factor for Alzheimer's disease is age. And that means that the older you get, the higher your risk is. Um, and the reason for that is that we think that over a lifetime, these other risk factors accumulate. And then at some point when, when you reach a certain age, it just brings you over the threshold to develop uh, symptoms. Um, so over the age of 65, 
uh, one in nine seniors is affected uh, with Alzheimer's disease over the age of 85, it's, it's one in three seniors. So you see that the older, um, you know, the, the higher the age, the higher the risk is. So uh, the risk differs by uh, sex. Um, two thirds of people with Alzheimer's disease are women. So women have a higher risk to develop the disease than men. Um, and there's a lot of research going into that. Uh, and you know, obviously it's important to find out why that's the case. Uh, we don't know yet exactly, but we think that it does have uh, that it's due to different genetic factors between men and women, and also due to differences in hormones. So, unfortunately, Alzheimer's disease right now is the only cause of death in the top 10 diseases that right now cannot be uh, prevented. Uh, so, in particular, um, you know, deaths from cancer and from heart disease and stroke have decreased significantly over the past 10 years due to much better treatments we have developed in this time. Um, but there's not been much change in deaths from Alzheimer's disease, which simply reflects that um, the progress we have made uh, in research. And uh, there's been a lot of progress made um, in cancer and heart disease and stroke. Um, but less so in Alzheimer's disease. So there are a lot of, uh, there are a lot of uh, causes of the disease um, we don't know yet. So, um, so Alzheimer's disease is obviously uh, very devastating for the individual and, and their families, but, but also on a public health level. So um, right now, as we said in, in 2017, we had about 6 million cases, but what we know that by the year 2050 or 51, this number will quadruple basically and go up to 16 million. And the reason is that people get older and older and live much longer than before due to uh, the better therapies in, in, in cancer, heart disease and stroke. Um, and that's why more people survive longer and live longer. And uh, that's, but that means that uh, we will have more and more people with Alzheimer's disease over the next decades. And that's gonna be a huge problem uh, for, um, for the public health system also uh, from a public health budget point of view. So um, this year, for example, Alzheimer's, just Alzheimer's disease will cost the nation about $290 billion. And by 2050, these costs are expected to rise to about $1.1 trillion. And uh, so already now it's the most expensive disease there is. And uh, you see these numbers here. And uh, this is obviously um, a big problem also from a public health perspective. So besides the burden on the individual uh, with Alzheimer's disease, it's also a particularly devastating disease for the caregivers and the families. So there, there are right now more than 15 million Americans who provide unpaid care for someone with Alzheimer's disease. And so in 2019, for example, it was 18.6 billion hours of care, um, which, which was unpaid. Um, and that means that caregivers, you know, because people with Alzheimer's disease usually at least in later stages need 24-7 need care. Uh, you cannot leave them unattended. And uh, that means that caregivers often need to leave the workforce um, in order to care for somebody, uh, for a loved one with Alzheimer's disease. And that means that obviously uh, there is a significant loss of income. So on average, caregivers lose about $15,000 annually um, but then also there's a significant medical toll and, and health toll on these caregivers. Um, so 
there is uh, taking care of somebody with Alzheimer's disease is extremely exhausting and stressful. Um, and so what we see is a lot of emotional distress, depression, anxiety, fatigue, there's social isolation because, um, you know, caregivers cannot go out, see their friends anymore, or, you know, socially interact with people simply because they cannot leave the house. Um, and there is uh, significant other health issues we are seeing a higher frequency of diabetes, a higher blood pressure. And, you know, you might know that these are risk factors for heart disease and stroke. So also these diseases are much, are more frequent in caregivers um, compared to people who do not take care of somebody with dementia. And um, what does it mean? It means that we also need to watch out not only for the people who develop dementia, but we also need to watch out for their caregivers. And, um, and, and it also means that, you know, if, if you're a caregiver, it's very important, you know, don't, uh, you, you also need to take care of your own health. And we see that again and again, that people really are so um, so dedicated to their loved one that they neglect their own health. And it's extremely important if you're a caregiver of somebody with dementia, um, take care of your own health to go to your doctor, uh, you know, get go, go to your annual checkups, um, take care of any kind of uh, medical issues you might have, diabetes, blood pressure, take them, get them under control. And also make sure that that you get help and that you get some rest. So Alzheimer's disease is particularly has a particularly high impact on our African American communities, also on our Hispanic communities. And and why is that? So in particular, African Americans have twice the risk of Alzheimer's disease compared to uh, non-Hispanic whites. So they are also more likely to have multiple cases in the family. And uh, often African-Americans are also diagnosed at a later stage. And as I said, that means that treatment is less effective. So, and because African-Americans have twice the risk, uh, we see more cases uh, in the community and also more cases per family it also puts a particularly high financial toll on African-American families. So um, obviously one important question is why do African-Americans, but also Hispanics have a higher risk compared to non-Hispanic whites? And uh, the answer here is that part of that is genetic. Genes differ uh, between ethnic groups um, and uh, so that's part of the answer. Um, the other part of the answer is that um, the, the frequency of certain risk factors is higher in African-Americans and Hispanics. Um, so um, the risk factors I'm talking about here is diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, um, heart disease, and stroke. So all of these increased risk of dementia. We know that that's been shown by many, many studies and, and, and all of these risk factors are, are more frequent in African-Americans and Hispanic compared to whites. So that's the other part of the answer. So it's differences in genetics and it's a higher frequency of uh, these risk factors um, in, in these populations and these ethnic groups. So and what does it mean for you? So it means that if you have any of these risk factors, if you have diabetes or heart disease, hypertension, high cholesterol, or you've had a stroke, make sure that, that go to your doctor, take your medication, make sure that you, know, you have your diabetes under control, you have your blood pressure under control, you have your cholesterol under control, okay? It's going to lower the risk of stroke. It's also going to lower the risk of heart disease, but also lower the risk of dementia. So it's also, it's also protecting your brain. So it's very, very important that you stay on top of this and that you go and see your doctor and you take your medication. So the question we are getting obviously right now uh, very often is what 
you know, what's the risk of somebody with dementia to to get COVID um, or the coronavirus? How does having the coronavirus uh, affect the outcome of dementia? Are people with dementia more at risk for coronavirus and so on? So, um, as you know, in particular, older people have a more are more severely affected by by coronavirus, and uh, in particular, people um, who are bedridden. Um, and uh, and this is this is also the case often for people with dementia. So people with dementia are a little bit at high risk um, simply because um, they are usually older. Um, they often have common health conditions. And, you know, it's also very obviously very difficult if somebody is in a later stage of dementia to follow um, safety precautions, you know. So, it's, you know, you might, you might try to put a mask on somebody with dementia, but, but often people with dementia would take it off. You know, they don't want to have it, they rip it off. Um, and um, it's very hard to reason with them. And uh, so, so also in terms of just making sure that the safety precautions are being followed is much more difficult in, 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 in um, you know, if you have a patient if, or if you have a loved one with dementia. Um, and that's why people with dementia are at a higher risk to contract COVID uh, compared to people without uh, dementia. And that means that you know, uh, care caretakers um, of people with dementia uh, should should contact the home uh, the home healthcare provider and the care facilities uh, to ask them to to explain their protocols for managing uh, COVID nineteen risks. So, if you have somebody in a nursing home, a loved one in a nursing home with dementia, contact the nursing home and you know ask them about the precautions they are taking. Um, and the CDC has provided guidance on uh, infection control and prevention of COVID-19 in nursing homes. And uh, this guidance also should be followed at home. Um, you know, as, as good as you can try to um, follow the, this guidance at home too in order to protect your loved one with dementia because they are at higher risk also of more severe outcomes of COVID. So, um, as I said, I also uh, will touch for a few minutes um, upon uh, research that is currently being done um, in, in New York City and uh, by our group there. Um, so obviously the, my, the main goal of the studies uh, conducted is to understand the causes and the risk factors of the disease um, to distinguish it from normal aging, to really see what is really pathological, what's normal aging, and to develop tools to diagnose the, the disease as early as possible and earlier as we can now, um, than, than we can now, and, uh, and also to, to ultimately not to just um, ameliorate the, ameliorate the, the, the signs and the symptoms, but really to treat and cure the disease effectively. So um, our biggest hope really lies in what we call precision medicine. It's sometimes also called personalized medicine. And uh, what does it mean? Um, that's a big initiative that was driven by the Obama administration in 2011. Um, which really intended to, to increase genomic research across all diseases so much that uh, we can treat individuals much better. And what does precision medicine mean? So um, for the last 20 or 30 years in cancer research, everybody with breast cancer would get the same chemotherapy. And then, you know, in some people it worked, but in other people it didn't work as well. And the reason for that is that not every person with breast cancer has the same cause of the breast cancer, in particular, the same gene that causes the breast cancer. Um, and what pre precision medicine does is that uh, you take somebody's blood, you look at their genetic code, you see, oh, what is really the gene causing the breast cancer? And then you give that person specifically the right therapy for that, for that gene. 
And uh, that really has revolutionized uh, cancer therapy over the last 10 years. Uh, most of the cancers are being, uh, we can treat much, much better now because of that extremely effectively. Um, and, uh, and that's really the hope um, that, that we are getting there um, for Alzheimer's disease too. And that would mean that, you know, somebody with memory problems goes to their doctor's office, you know, and the only thing they need to do is take a, do a blood draw. With just taking a blood draw, you can look at people's genes. You say, okay, that person has that gene which is causing the dementia. And that's why, you know, that person gets drug A and the other person with a different gene gets drug B. Mm -hmm. Um, and that would mean that um, it's really personalized to the individual um, and tailored to the individual genetic makeup. And uh, this is really where we need to get. And this is where the, the, where the Alzheimer's disease research field is moving. So, uh, so this, is, this is where, uh, where, where the Alzheimer's, where the future will be for Alzheimer's disease therapy. Um, but that also means obviously that first we need to identify the genes that cause the disease um, in individuals. And then based on that, we need to develop the specific therapies for each of the genes. So, so why, again, why are we looking at genes? Uh, genes are the key to understand disease, any disease, not only Alzheimer's disease, but genes are the key to understand any disease. Um, and, uh, and, and identifying the genes um, in people with Alzheimer's disease will help us to understand what goes wrong in the brain and why. And this is really the most critical step to finding an effective personalized medicine. So, um, and what we would have then is instead of a one size fits all approach, as I said, everybody gets the same medication, uh, which might work in some, but not in all. Um, really the, the therapies would be tailored to an individual's genetic makeup. And that's why it's called personalized medicine. So um, over the last 10 years, we have discovered more than 30 genes already. Um, and that's been, that has really led to a tremendous progress um, of our understanding for the, of the disease. So what we know now because of these genetic studies is that inflammation in the brain, cholesterol, um, and the communication of brain cells is part of the disease um, and, and causing the disease. Um, and, and what we have also seen is that the, the, the mutations causing the disease differ between ethnic groups. Um, that's why it's very important to conduct separate studies in different ethnic groups. But we also know that this is not the full answer of the question. We know that there are more genes uh, that have not been discovered yet, uh, in particular in uh, non-white populations. And I'm saying non-white populations simply because most of these genetic studies have been done in whites. And it's extremely important now that we conduct the same studies, genetic studies in other ethnic groups too. So, and this is the goal of one of the studies we are doing, which is called the NI Lord Family Study. That's a study which has been going on for over 20 years. Um, it's been involved in discovering all of these 30 genes. It's extremely successful, it's nationwide. Uh, we have um, over 1,200 families in this study. Um, and uh, it's the largest and across the globe, it's the largest and the most frequently used Alzheimer's disease genetic data set in the world. So, um, and uh, it was specifically designed to identify genes, genes causing Alzheimer's disease. So, um, so we're particular recruiting now African-American participants and also Hispanic participants in this study uh, with the reason to really uh, identify the genes specifically causing the disease in these ethnic groups. And um, if your family, if you are or a family member or a friend uh, is affected by memory problems, um, you know, please consider joining the study uh, because without study participants, obviously, 
you know, there's, uh, we don't have any possibility to find the causes of the disease or develop a therapy. And just uh, to tell you quickly what um, participation entails, it's pretty quick, uh, it's painless. Um, it can be either done at, at, at Columbia or we also can come to your home now. Currently in the COVID times, uh, we are doing everything, pretty much everything, just uh, via a Zoom call. So um, what participation means is that uh, we do a brief memory test. We do a questionnaire of your medical history. Um, all this would be done via Zoom right now. Once COVID is over, uh, we are seeing um, study participants in person again. And uh, then we are taking a blood sample um, in order to, to be able to look um, at the genes. Um, all collected information um, will be de-identified. De so there's no names attached to a memory test. There's no names attached to a blood sample. Um, every study participant will just have a number assigned in our system. Um, so another very important point to make here is that, you know, we can also have, we are more than happy to help you see the right doctor because, and, and I'm saying that because, you know, we often, um, we know that, that many people in the community don't know, you know, who to turn to with their questions, you know, which doctor to see, where there's a memory clinic, and so on. So um, if you need help or a loved one need help, we are more than happy uh, to refer you uh, to the right doctor. We can help you to see somebody in Queens who is specialized in this. Um, we have, I think on the last slide, um, I'm showing our contact information. So you could write that down, you could contact us and you know we can help you uh, to see the right doctor. Um, so these are, um, these, are, these are my study coordinators um, who, can, who can help you with this. Um, Isri Martinez, uh, also on the call today, and Sandra Fonseca. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I hope that um, this presentation answers many of the questions uh, you've had. And um, I'm circling back to, to Sandra um, for the next section of the webinar. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ritz. Um, so I just, before going uh, to answer the questions that we have on the Q&A, uh, we would like to, to start a questionnaire and we would like to let people know that it's voluntary, your response, and the data collected, uh, Columbia University will use it to follow up with you and the response will, will not be retained by the Queen's Borough President. So we would like to ask you to kindly answer the question to give us a feedback about the presentation. It's on your screen now and you can directly click on the response. So we'll give you some time to, to respond. And thanks in advance for, for giving us the feedback. I hope everyone can see the questions on the screen. You can directly uh, respond them just by clicking on the response. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, now we'll, 
the doctor rates will answer the question on the q and a uh, function and carolina from the borough president she will be moderating hi thank you uh, our the our question is, how is it determined that a person has Alzheimer's disease and not slower recall or familiar terms? Is memorization of quotes a help in improving the chances of not contracting Alzheimer's disease? It's a two-part question. Yes, so I start out with the second part. Uh, so any kind of training of your brain you can do you know, starting when you're young and all throughout your life is going to lower the risk of, of becoming uh, demented. So, you know, if you can do something like crossword puzzles, uh, reading, you know, the newspaper and really engaging your brain, um, that is going to lower the risk of dementia. So it's very important uh, to do that. Um, for the, the, the first part of the question, if I understand it correctly, what are, uh, how can you tell that somebody has dementia, right? That's the question. Um, so there, there are several signs which are very typical of dementia. Um, having problems with short-term memory, misplacing objects, uh, problems with simple calculations, mood swings, uh, problems with um, naming objects, what is the what is the really not knowing words you have known before for, for certain objects. So um, these are typical signs of dementia. And if you see um, a change, a consistent but clear change in any of this, in your loved one or in yourself, then that might be something to be concerned about and where you where I would recommend you to go and see, see a doctor. Thank you for your answer. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to remind everyone uh, attending, if you have a question, uh, to please type it in the Q&A portion of the webinar so that we can go ahead and answer it. So we'll give uh, a few seconds to see if we get other questions. In the meantime, if you guys want to uh, share your contact information or uh, for everyone watching on our website, that would be great. I'll do that. Um... So as uh, Dr. Reeds mentioned during the presentation, uh, if you're interested in participating on the study, there were contact with Dr. Martinez, she's the coordinator and myself as well. And also this is my contact. If you wanna keep up, stay up to date for future events or either if you have questions about Alzheimer, um, if you wanna learn more about the, the, the study that we're doing and if you want support if you don't know, if you're a caregiver and you don't know the resources or who to reach out, we can connect you with our, uh, we have a, a center dedicated at Columbia specifically for Alzheimer's. We have social workers and other health professionals that can assist you. And we will be more than happy, happy to connect you with not only with those uh, healthcare professionals, but also uh, institutions and organizations that uh, give support to caregivers. So we work closely with many organizations in the communities in general. So Phil, uh, do, do not hesitate to contact us. This is my email, sf2997 at cumc.columbia.edu. It seems that we, we have more questions, so you can go ahead, Caroline. Yes, thank you. Um, I see someone just joined, uh, they, they realized uh, they joined at the wrong time. They wanted to know if there are slides available. Uh, we do want to let you guys know uh, this is being broadcast live on YouTube, so you can go back and rewatch. Uh, so it's being recorded and uh, it can be shared. 
So if you missed it and are just joining, uh, you can replay the video on our website at www.queensbp.org or at, um, if you go to YouTube, to our website, uh, to our YouTube page. Uh, the next question is from Evelyn. Besides your primary care doctor, who else should patients see if they suspect beginning of cognitive impairment? Right, so the primary care doctor would be the first person uh, to see and uh, they can refer you to the specialist and the specialist uh, you would be referred to as a neurologist. Um, so what you could also do is you can, you can go uh, to a memory clinic, okay? You could do that immediately. So there are memory clinics uh, in all the major hospitals uh, in New York City, we can also distribute a list of the memory clinics, uh, available memory clinics in Queens. Um, and that is the other option. Uh, if you go to your primary care physician, they would also refer you to a neurologist or can refer you to a memory clinic. Great, thank you. That uh, leads to my next question uh, from Elizabeth. Uh, she wanted to know if you uh, guys have a memory clinic, uh, and if not, how can uh, you can you provide a link uh, to the list that you mentioned earlier? We do have a memory clinic, and uh, and we can provide the information. So what you could do is you could just either contact Sandra or Isri. You know, we can help you uh, get an appointment there. We can also distribute the information and the link uh, and the phone number to make an appointment. Great. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You guys so also, I'm sorry, you guys can share that email on the chat yeah. for people attending so that they can see it. That would be great. Oh, sure. I'll do that. And also uh, um, the presentation, today's presentation, and we have a booklet with all of these resources, uh, we have a list per borough and for all the in New York, New York City. So we will be contacting the re, you know the people that register for this webinar afterwards uh, with all of that information if they would like to receive it. Thank you, and that uh, is a wrap. We don't have any more questions, um, so uh, I want to take this opportunity uh, to thank you guys. Um, and if you have any further information you'd like to share before we end, uh, that would be great. Thank you. Okay, so I put the contacts in the chat, so that's my email. Um, feel free to contact us if any questions uh, in, and concerns that you may have. Also, uh, we would like to, to thank so much the Queensboro president and his staff, uh, Brian, Caroline, and Chris, um, especially for all the support. Uh, it was really a pleasure to work with you. Uh, we really appreciate this opportunity to share this important information with the community with Queen's community. And uh, today as a group, we have taken a step further to combating Alzheimer's disease. Uh, we are helping everyone associated with Alzheimer's to improve their quality of life. And those who has Alzheimer's and the caregivers are benefiting from the work that we're doing. So without further ado, just wanted to say thank you uh, again to the audience to be here with us. We look forward to keep in touch with everyone. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to be in contact with us. Again, all the data collected today, uh, it will, we will, the responses that you gave to the questionnaire, it will, per, we, it's just for the purpose to follow up with you. Uh, just Columbia University will have that data and it, it, it won't be retained by Queensboro president. Thank you so much. Have a good night, everyone. And keep staying safe. Dr. Francesca, I'm sorry to um, jump right in. We did get one last question. Do you mind uh, if I, do you guys answer that? Go ahead. Uh, the question comes uh, from uh, one of our person, uh, people attending. If a loved one is constantly repeating the same subject, could that be a sign of uh, Alzheimer's? It depends on if that's been a change uh, compared to before. So if 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 you see a change in that and somebody has not done that before, uh, but now 
uh, is doing that, and that's a constant change, it can be a sign of uh, of Alzheimer's disease, and you should you should um, have that person see their doctor. Thank you. So I think we um, that's all for tonight. Thank you again. Have a good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Bye.